It is an honor to speak today before the Hillsdale Classical Liberal Organization. I'm glad to see the turnout today, and I'll make an effort to make this particular presentation very relevant to the Hillsdale campus. In fact, while I think this is a perfectly polite speech to deliver, if I had been a student at Hillsdale College today, I'm not sure if I would have been able or permitted to present this speech, because the topic is the perils of cultural homogeneity, and I think it at least has the potential of being a very sensitive topic on the Hillsdale campus. Hillsdale is not, by any stretch of the imagination, a culturally homogeneous place. It is a very intellectually rich and diverse place. However, I fear that there are some elements on this campus that are actively trying to homogenize it. And in order to resist that homogenization, and indeed in order for Hillsdale to maintain and attain its full potential, we need to examine why cultural homogeneity is so dangerous. And we need to have rational arguments that we can levy against it. So let me start with an observation made by one of my favorite thinkers, Voltaire, who visited England in the 1730s. And he observed several notable facts. He wrote that in France, there are two religions, and they are constantly at one another's throats. In England, there are 30 religions, and their practitioners live together in peace and harmony. He also observed that on the London Exchange, you can find people of pretty much any major religion. You can find Christians, Jews, Muslims, and they all trade peacefully and reserve the name of infidel for those who go bankrupt. It was an excellent testament to how commerce and free exchange and more generally the liberty of the individual can unite very different people through the exchange of values, through what Ayn Rand would later call the traitor principle. And I think this is not just applicable to England in the 1730s, it's applicable to any culture and any time and any place. It's applicable on a large scale to an entire country, and it's applicable on a small scale to an educational institution like Hillsdale. So what is cultural diversity? I would argue that true cultural diversity is a much broader concept than many in left-leaning academic institutions would portray it as being. Indeed, my critique of diversity as it's conventionally used by the left is that the term goes only skin deep, literally. The purveyors of this kind of cultural diversity try to achieve it through affirmative action programs, be it explicit racial or gender-based or ethnic quotas, or just slightly different standards to encourage more attendance by a certain circumstantial group, for instance, a racial group or an ethnic group. And I think that misses the point of what diversity is about. Many on the religious and political right allege that this is the problem with diversity, that there's too much diversity because there are these affirmative action policies and the superficial emphasis on race in certain institutions of higher education. My argument is precisely the opposite. This kind of diversity does not go far enough. It is mainly a diversity of appearance rather than a diversity of substance. What is a diversity of substance? Naturally, it is right to accept individuals despite and indeed because of differences in race and ethnicity and religion or lack thereof and I would say sexual orientation or lack thereof. The politically correct form of diversity often just stops there. But the most important diversity doesn't even exist at that level. It exists at the level of the individual. It is a diversity of ideas, of personalities, and of ways of living. And it's often a diversity that defies tidy classification. Any stereotype you have about a group of people will probably be broken if you encounter enough individuals whom you would consider to be in that group. So ultimately, it is diversity at the individual level that is precious. And I would even go further than characterizing my position as a support of diversity. I will use the rather controversial term hyperpluralism. Indeed, I am so hyperpluralistic 
that I want in the United States over 300 million different persuasions to exist. That's the level of the individual. And lest you think that this position is somehow contrary to the spirit of reason or liberty or the American founding ideals, James Madison would have agreed with me. He said, the best way to control the damage that is wreaked by factions is to multiply the factions to such an extent that no one faction can exercise enough influence to suppress others. This is the way in which Madison proposed to improve the American Republic over the very small city-state republics that preceded it historically. So I think this hyperpluralism is very much a logical extension of the principles of James Madison and many of the other American founders who, like Thomas Jefferson, Benjamin Franklin, Ethan Allen, even to a certain degree George Washington, were not homogenizing religious right kinds of conservatives. They were classical liberals. They didn't always hold classically liberal views on everything, but that was the animating principle that fueled the founding of the United States. And it's very unfortunate that today, true diversity is very often stifled by both the religious right and the politically correct left. And in this presentation, I'm going to try to devote fairly equal time to criticizing both of these homogenizing influences. So what is the attitude necessary for true cultural diversity? There's an excellent term for it. It's called cosmopolitanism. I would characterize cosmopolitanism, which comes from the Greek term meaning citizen of the universe, as an awareness of the immense variety among human beings, as the recognition that you're not just part of your particular little in-group, your particular family, your city, your country, your ethnic group. You're a citizen of the world and a citizen of the universe. And there are common elements, indeed, that all human beings share with one another. These are crucial common elements that render individual liberty necessary for a society to flourish. So toleration is another key term when understanding cultural diversity. There are immense differences among human beings, and there are many differences that one could rightly consider suboptimal. But even those differences ought to be tolerated as long as they do not impose coercive harm upon others. A good, concise way to characterize it is people should have the right to be wrong. The attitudes of cosmopolitanism and toleration have classical liberalism as their political corollary. Classical liberalism recognizes and protects through law the right of every individual to choose his or her own ideas and peaceful ways of living. Indeed, the only intolerance that classical liberalism displays is toward coercive intolerance. Let me read to you a quotation from Ludwig von Mises, who, as many of you might know, was perhaps the predominant economist within the Austrian school, certainly a master of economic thought, but he also wrote excellent historical and philosophical and sociological commentaries that are very much worth reading. So what he said was, liberalism must be intolerant of every kind of intolerance. If one considers the peaceful cooperation of all men as the goal of social evolution, one cannot permit the peace to be disturbed by priests and fanatics. Liberalism proclaims tolerance for every religious faith and every metaphysical belief, not out of indifference for these higher things, but from the conviction that the assurance of peace within society must take precedence over everything and everyone. And because it demands toleration of all opinions and all churches and sects, it must recall them all to their proper bounds when they venture intolerantly beyond them. So I find it amusing sometimes that the phrase no tolerance for intolerance is a favorite whipping boy of those on the cultural and religious right who oppose diversity. But who uttered that phrase? It was Ludwig von Mises the great Austrian free market economist who donated his personal library to Hillsdale College. Clearly, I don't think it's appropriate 
to scorn that kind of sentiment of expanding the boundaries of tolerance as far as humanly possible until they hit against this wall of violence and coercion and coercive intolerance, which naturally cannot coexist with tolerance and cosmopolitanism. If some people are violently cracking down on those who are different and their crackdowns are permitted to continue, well, the rest of us can't any longer have the assurance that we will be tolerated. So cultural homogeneity is the opposite of genuine diversity. And as I previously alluded to, cultural homogeneity is very dangerous. It is dangerous in one significant respect because it can only be achieved through force. There is no such concept or state as voluntary cultural homogeneity because the natural diversity of human experiences is far too great. There are now 7 billion people on this planet each of them leads his or her own life. One of my favorite ways of viewing this is to think of each human being, each human mind, as a universe unto itself. This is why I think death is so wrong, because when a human being dies, an entire universe is extinguished. And that is the greatest tragedy one can imagine, because an entire world of thoughts, of experiences, of memories, of aspirations is just snuffed out. And when there is a regime or a paradigm that actively extinguishes these universes, well, that is an atrocity that a freedom-loving individual cannot tolerate. So the very fact that all of these different minds focus on different areas of reality in the course of their day-to-day -day activities implies that each of them will form a different view of the world, at least in terms of emphasis. Even if there is agreement on certain ideas, they'll be viewed through a different lens. For instance, I would imagine that I have in common with most of you the fact that we value liberty. However, you've probably studied the works of thinkers to a different extent or in different proportions than I have. For instance, you might have read more Herbert Spencer, and I might have read more Bastiat, or I might have read more Adam Smith. I probably did because I've read the entirety of The Wealth of Nations from cover to cover. Very interesting reading that I would highly recommend, and Adam Smith will come into this particular presentation a little bit later as well. But even if we have some of these fundamental similarities, as well as differences of perspective, it will also always be the case that we will never agree with one another on everything. And the deeper you drill down, even between two people whose views are very similar, the more fine points of disagreement you will discover. Furthermore, most people, probably close to all people, will disagree with some of their own earlier held views. There are certainly many views that I used to hold that I no longer hold, I believe as a result of improved knowledge and better reasoning. But if you ask me, what did you once believe that you no longer believe today? I could go on at great length discussing that. And I think this is probably true for you. At Hillsdale, the statement of Richard Weaver that ideas have consequences is very popular. And I think, broadly speaking, it is a true statement. But one has to be very careful when interpreting that statement because while it is true, it's also the case that the consequences of a given idea are seldom, if ever, the same for all people. Because of the different backgrounds and experiences we have and the choices that we've made, when one person thinks of a particular idea, they will apply it differently than another person. So many advocates of cultural homogeneity will unfortunately think that the same idea will have the same consequences when embodied in any human being or in any institution or in any time and place. And I think there definitely is no evidence to support that view and all of the evidence is to the contrary. Now, when human beings are left free, they will naturally form associations of immense and highly beneficial diversity. If the same ideas work through them in different ways or different ideas work through them in different ways, they'll find the opportunity to capitalize on that. I have something that you do not, you have something that I do not, and I value what you have more than what I have. Your order of preferences is inverted from that, and that means there's the opportunity for trade, again, what Ayn Rand called the trader principle. And through trade, through the exchange of values, and they don't have to be physical goods, they can be services, they can be emotional values like friendship, through the exchange of values, we all become better off. 
Now, if all human beings were completely homogeneous with no substantive differences among them, first of all, the division of labor wouldn't be as effective. It might still exist to a certain extent, but certainly not as much. There would be fewer reasons for human beings to cooperate with one another. There would be fewer reasons for human beings to trade values in any respect. And that trade wouldn't be there to connect them to one another. This kind of hyperpluralism and diversity can be very unifying as well in a positive way in that it keeps human beings peaceful, it enables human beings to cooperate, and, of course, it fuels the progress of our civilization. The leaders of a culturally homogeneous society endeavor to supplant the free interaction toward which most humans are inclined with regimentation in favor of a particular vision of the so-called good life or the good society. And that can be a set of doctrines, it can be a pattern of rituals, or it can be a set of ways in which individuals interact with one another or structure their economic activities. It can extend to very intimate spheres like the family. Proponents of cultural homogeneity will often appeal to so-called shared values within a given culture. And the biggest problem with what they try to do is they try to give those shared values a force beyond that of voluntary assent. If we agree with one another on something and we want to work together on it, great. But if somebody else, a third party, comes in and says, you must think this way, you must live this way, you may not live a certain other way, even though it wouldn't harm anybody but yourself and may even benefit you, then we run into very serious problems. So another issue with this is these culturally homogenizing elites believe that they have already identified the specific, quote, right thoughts, actions, and ways of living. And they furthermore hold that a single unitary scheme of living is best for all. It's, again, this vulgar interpretation of Richard Weaver's maxim that ideas have consequences. This interpretation would hold that, well, there's some idea out there that has the best possible consequences, and the best consequences uniformly for all human beings, and therefore everybody must abide by this idea. Clearly an empirically unsupported falsehood, but that seems to be the mentality of those who wish to homogenize a given culture. And if this were just their personal preference, if they were just out there talking about how they believe this is the best way the world ought to be, for instance, that it is best for everybody to wear brightly colored yellow and orange ties, then one could consider their preferences to be wrong and unjustified, but they would still be within the realm of tolerable opinion. It's at that point where they try to go beyond that and impose it on others via force that it becomes problematic. Because I think somewhere in the back of their minds, these proponents of cultural homogeneity know that if they just talk about their vision of the good life, there will still be many people who disagree and who will not live that way. And it frustrates them that this is the case. So they try to go beyond mere persuasion and use violent force. And that's where classical liberalism and cosmopolitanism have to come in and mount a staunch defense of individual liberty and of true cultural diversity. So I'm going to go through eight major perils of cultural homogeneity that I've identified, and this is by no means an exhaustive list. When I was writing this particular essay, these were just the perils that were most salient in my mind, but if you think about the subject in sufficient depth, I'm sure you will be able to identify many others. But still, this is a good starting point. It's a good way to equip those of us who want to defend a genuinely free society from the homogenizing influences. The kind of free society that we want was termed by Karl Popper as the open society, the society that welcomes new ideas, that welcomes innovation, that welcomes different ways of doing things that could possibly lead to improvements. So the first peril is that cultural homogeneity is always dictated by the leaders, not embraced voluntarily by the people in that culture. Very often, the proponents of cultural homogeneity will try to abstract away from individuals All the characteristics, except just a few, that the homogenizers consider important, for instance, race, religion, ethnicity, or another doctrine that some people hold to and others don't. But human diversity is naturally too great for people to fit into these little homogeneous templates. And so the leaders and their propagandists 
who desire homogeneity try to make people fit into these templates using force to punish the non-compliant. If you leave people to their own devices, even many people who would strongly disagree in certain respects will find ways to get along and trade with one another and profit from one another's differences. But the homogenizing elite will often not allow that. Because ultimately, I think, whenever you're faced with any attempt to homogenize a culture, you should ask the question that Marcus Tullius Cicero asked, which is, qui bono? Who benefits? Who gains as a result of this effort? And I would say it's the leaders of that effort in their desire for power and influence, which they will certainly have more of if they achieve their single desired static vision of the good life or the good society. And they'll obviously have a lot of wealth and influence if they're in charge of regimenting people to fulfill that ideal. It's a lucrative spot if you can get it. But for the rest of us, it means slavery to those people and limitations on our own abilities and aspirations. The second peril is that cultural homogeneity stifles progress and innovation. When human beings are forcibly conformed to any predetermined template of conduct other than the mere abstinence from inflicting harm upon others, that implies a necessarily static view of the world. Again, the view that the ideal patterns of behavior are already known and optimal, perfectly revealed to the people in charge. And that's despite the obvious evils, inefficiencies, and miseries of the real world. 150,000 people die every single day. Of those, 50,000 people do not die from senescence. They die from all of the other causes, from senseless accidents or murder or war or any host of other dismal kinds of perils that we human beings have not yet managed to completely eradicate. Now, that should tell us something about the capacity of any person or any group of people today to claim that they know the entirety of the truth or the good life. Human beings, I believe, are still fundamentally in a state of barbarism. They haven't resolved some of the most fundamental questions that should have a solution to them. For instance, how do we maintain our own bodies and prevent them from lapsing into this gradual and often gruesome and painful and unpleasant decay, terminating in death. And we can extend the same question to the level of human societies. How do we set up the right incentives within a society or government to prevent what has historically been, thus far, an inevitable decline into either tyranny or chaos or both. If human beings haven't yet answered these very elementary fundamental questions, then that doesn't speak well for those who believe that they already know what the entirety of the good life or the right way to do things is all about. This is still something that needs to be discovered and worked on very diligently. So in that static world, one is required to cleave to the so-called cultural identity or else, and there's little room for trying new ways to solve these old pressing problems that, unless they're solved anytime soon, will afflict and destroy every one of us. A culture where ideas and behaviors are regimented will not develop the needed solutions. It will not develop the new technologies needed to solve those problems. It will not develop economic arrangements that can better cultivate human prosperity and potential. And where no deviation is permitted from this foreordained, revealed answer, discovery is foreclosed on from the very beginning. We don't want that. The third peril is that cultural homogeneity tramples on the rights of those who seek a different path. And this is irrespective of how much the leaders of the homogenizing effort try to claim that they're really just articulating values shared by all, that they really just represent the people or the common good or whatever platitudes they want to put in there to essentially embellish their own desires for power. Because there will always be people who disagree. And enforced cultural homogeneity offers them the pitiable alternative either to suppress their better judgment, and to conform because they want to be safe. But in that case, they would still remain suspected outsiders. Or their other choice is to be punished through deprivation of opportunities, at best, because the elite controls the opportunities in that kind of society, or through outright physical harm to themselves or their families. And because there will always be these kinds of dissenters, and because they will suffer from the enforcement of lifestyle and ideological norms, the pursuit of cultural homogeneity will always inflict grievous harm upon actual living human beings. 
And that's important to remember. It's not just a clash of ideas. If it is the case that ideas have consequences, then some ideas have much better consequences than others. And the idea of enforced cultural homogeneity doesn't have very good consequences at all. Very often, these minority elements in that kind of society will be harmed for no active choice of their own, simply because they were born into the wrong family, or in the wrong part of the world, or speaking the wrong language. It happens today. It happens in many places in the world. It happens in the United States. Consider, for instance, how undocumented immigrants to this country are treated today. Under the Obama administration, the number and rate of deportations, forcible deportations, has been unprecedented. And lest you think that a deportation simply involves being handed some papers and told to leave the country on the next flight, very often that's not how it happens. Very often what happens is the government employs certain contractors that will forcefully remove an individual to an interim camp where this person waits to be deported, waits for all of the deportation paperwork to be processed and then to be sent on whatever flight or ship that gets arranged for that, often these people stay there for months under miserable conditions and neither the federal government nor its contractors care particularly much about what those conditions are. So this desire to homogenize the United States on the part of certain nativist elements in this country has caused grievous harm to hundreds of thousands of individuals and even the ones who stay face constant fear and deprivation of economic opportunity. The fourth peril is that cultural homogeneity politicizes and perverts the dominant culture. Even if you think that dominant culture is good, attempts to homogenize it cannot turn out well for it because even that cultural paradigm becomes corrupted by the ruling elite. Instead of developing spontaneously based on the creative energies of those who are involved in it, this culture becomes dictated by the elites. And in order to create new exemplars of that culture, people can no longer act on their own initiative. They have to ask permission. And that can be in the arts, in the economy, or in everyday personal interaction. The question before them, then, in trying to improve their own culture, something that they embrace, is no longer is it sensible or even is it good, but rather is it permitted Or if they want to have any degree of flourishing in that society, the question they want to be asking is, will it earn me favor with the powers that be? The fifth peril is that cultural homogeneity weakens the capacity for argumentation and rational thinking. In a homogeneous society, one does not often encounter different views because all of the different views have been suppressed or discouraged in a variety of ways. And the skeptics and the critics of those views are rarely to be found. So the norms of that culture become embraced by default, unthinkingly, by virtue of not facing any challenges. And this is worse, actually, for genuinely beneficial norms than for arbitrary and unjustified ones, because the very capacity of that homogeneous culture to rationally defend the beneficial norms is undermined. John Stuart Mill, in his 1859 treatise on liberty, presented an excellent argument as to why all differences of opinion should be tolerated. Irrespective of whether the other person is right or wrong, there is some benefit to be obtained from having that opinion voiced and interacting with that opinion. So let's examine the cases. Let's say you disagree with someone and that other person happens to be right. Well, if you silence that other person, then you are losing out on all the benefits and added knowledge and improved understanding of the world that a true understanding of that person's position would entail. Also, it's possible that that person is partially wrong, but also partially right. In interacting with that person, you would be able to at least somewhat improve your own understanding and gain something. And even if that person is completely wrong and you interact with that person, you will find out many useful things you will find out, first of all, what the wrong view is. And that will prevent you from building up straw men and misrepresenting what the other person is actually thinking. Second, you will be able to more clearly identify why that individual is wrong, and you will be able to refine your own skills of argumentation, which will help you in the future to debunk the wrong idea and promote a better understanding. So clearly, even if someone is completely wrong, it's still a good idea to have that person around and to have that person espousing those ideas, and maybe that person might even be persuaded to improve his or her position. 
A person who faces no opposition to his ideas becomes intellectually brittle and enfeebled. It's like not having any physical exercise. Well, eventually, your body will atrophy, and it will not perform as well. You will not be as healthy, you will not live as long, you will not have as much energy. The same can happen to a society if it suppresses the free discussion of ideas and the pursuit of truth by different individuals, which includes the pursuit of different lifestyles. The sixth peril is a very alarming one. It is that cultural homogeneity produces anti-intellectualism, bigotry, crudity, and brutishness. And this is in addition to the intellectual weakness and atrophy. It's not just that the society withers away. It's that there's an element in it that comes to be actively destructive. The individuals that comprise this element are typically not particularly bright to begin with. But in a free society, they would be relegated to roles where they would remain harmless or even beneficial in certain respects because one doesn't have to be particularly intellectually bright to perform every kind of task. So there would be a place for these people in the division of labor and a place for them to find meaning, to coexist peacefully with other individuals and to improve themselves. However, in a culturally homogeneous environment, these individuals become the enforcers of the status quo. And they can be formal enforcers appointed by the ruling authority. Think of, for instance, the Hitler Youth or the various secret police organizations of communist dictatorships. Or they can be informal. They can be just ad hoc bands of thugs. They can be like the lynch mobs of the American South. Or they can be like the mobs during the French Revolution that cheered in the thousands as various individuals deemed by Robespierre and the Jacobins to be enemies of the revolution were summarily guillotined. So clearly, clearly this is not a desirable element. This element, because it's not particularly bright, is very susceptible to a tribalist mentality, which is the most primitive kind of thinking. It confines one's sympathies to a very narrow in-group, and everybody who's outside that in-group is the other. And the other, according to that mentality, doesn't have human worth, doesn't have legitimacy, and can be exploited or suppressed for the benefit of the in-group. This is how most human beings thought for the majority of human prehistory, which is why we didn't have very much progress at that time. During 99% of the time that the human species has existed, it has been nearly stagnant because this kind of tribalism was predominant. It's only when more sophisticated, more cosmopolitan civilizations emerged that we started actually improving standards of living from one generation to the next. And it's only when some thinkers completely transcended tribalism during the 18th century via the Enlightenment that we saw the consequences of that via the Industrial Revolution and subsequent technological revolutions up through the Information Revolution and the Biotechnology Revolution of our time, which in a mere few centuries and more recently in a mere few decades have elevated our standards of living to a greater extent than they've been raised in the entirety of preceding human history. So overcoming this tribalistic, brutish element is very important. But in a culturally homogeneous society, the ruling elites will often tolerate that element, either explicitly or tacitly. Even if the elites are disgusted by the depredations of these brutes, they will at least say, well, their hearts are in the right place, as long as they're enforcing the mentality that the elites want to be enforced, and as long as their energies are devoted to stamping out dissent against the dominant culture. Without that kind of enforcement, no environment of cultural homogeneity can persist because the elites themselves are typically far too sophisticated to engage in this kind of savagery. Indeed, it's very interesting. During the antebellum American South, the environment of slavery, which was a brutal and also very culturally homogeneous environment, could not have persisted if it were just the masters and the slaves. There was a third element of a lot of very crude, uneducated white yeoman farmers in the South who terribly resented the slaves and indeed even envied the slaves because they feared that the slaves would somehow usurp their position and the slaves even lived better. And the resentment and the votes of these white yeoman farmers essentially kept the slave system in line and allowed the southern states to continue passing punitive legislation that essentially mandated slavery and prevented the free market mechanisms that would have eradicated it without any war. 
And another great example, pretty much contemporaneous to that era, could be found in Europe, where there were tides of virulent, bloodthirsty nationalism in various countries of Europe throughout the 19th century. Ultimately, this nationalistic fervor, of course, culminated in the carnage of World War I. But the elites that were overseeing these countries were very famous for having a strategy of dynastic intermarriage. At one point, pretty much all of the royalty of Europe was related to England's Queen Victoria, either by blood or by marriage. So it's really odd to think about it that certain of the, shall I say, less refined elements of a particular society hold these bigotries, but the elites that benefit from these bigotries aren't themselves bigoted. None of the European aristocracy, and I think even very few of the southern slaveholders, were particularly racist or ethnicist or hateful toward the other. But I think they saw some expediency in maintaining these biases within the lower strata of societies that were, of course, very stratified. And in American political discourse, it's very interesting that a certain element, I would call it the populist right, exemplified by people like Sarah Palin or Christine O'Donnell, tries to artificially create this element through the glorification of the crude and the uncultured, the Joe Sixpack. So that's very alarming, I think, and definitely something to pay attention to in the political discourse. The seventh peril is that cultural homogeneity weakens and undermines the entire society. And the parallel I like to use here is to evolutionary biology. When you have a genetically homogeneous population, it's very vulnerable to a cataclysm or a disease or a disaster of any sort that comes along. Let's say there's a particular disease that targets a certain gene. And if everyone in a given population has that gene, well, that's too bad. The population gets wiped out. If there's a little bit of variety in there and some specimens do not have that gene or have immunity to the particular disease, then there is a chance of the population surviving that particular cataclysm. So it's pretty clear that in biology, homogeneity is ill-advised. And I think the same applies to culture, and it applies even more importantly, because while biological heterogeneity can save some specimens, but it will not save all of them, some will still fall prey to whatever cataclysm there is, in a culturally diverse society, the diversity can actually rescue everybody, because you're not predetermined to fail just because you were born a certain way. Other people's insights, other people's innovations, other people's different ways of thinking could rescue you. There are many situations, for instance, in which if there were no people that were unlike me, I would clearly have perished. If there was any major natural disaster, a flood, an earthquake, or even a fire in my neighborhood, I wouldn't have the physical strength, I wouldn't have the resourcefulness, I wouldn't have the composure to respond to emergencies that would be necessary to save people's lives and perhaps even my own. So it's clear that there need to be people in our society that do have these kinds of skills and do have these kinds of advantages. And to suppress any one of these dispositions or skill sets is very ill-advised, precisely because you never know when it might be useful to you. In a culturally homogeneous society, there is either one variant or just several accepted variants of what a good human being is or what a tolerated human being is. And within those variants, there's a lot of hierarchy. There's a lot of stratification. There's a lot of subordination of one type to another, like the slave master, white yeoman farmer triangle in the antebellum American South. And it's clear that one of these elements looked down on the others, one of these elements was just completely oppressed and unhappy and debilitated, and the third element, that of the white yeoman farmers, was also resentful toward the slaves, and that kept them in line. So, very volatile kind of mix if you have any serious problem within the society. The eighth and last peril that I would like to discuss before I go into some more Hillsdale-specific examples is that cultural homogeneity is incompatible with truth and justice. So let's say that we genuinely hold that truth is objective and that it empowers you when it is known. As Francis Bacon said, knowledge is power. Then a corollary of that belief should be that the objective truth and the pursuit of that truth should trump any societally held intersubjective conventions. 
And what I'm doing here is actually very interesting if you pay attention to it, because a lot of people accuse advocates of true diversity or hyperpluralism of being relativist. But what I'm arguing here is that the true relativists are the ones that want to impose a single set of norms on everybody, because that set of conventions isn't necessarily part of natural law. It's not objective. It's intersubjective. It's imposed by fiat, and it's intended to override the true understanding of things, which can only be discovered through this open competitive process. It's like price competition on a free market or competition for what is the product that consumers want. One of the great insights of Austrian economics, of Ludwig von Mises and Friedrich Hayek, is that in advance it is not known what the optimal allocation of resources is. The whole function of the competitive process is to serve as a discovery mechanism to essentially arrive at an understanding of what that is, what do consumers really want, what allocation of resources is best for maximizing human well-being. You can't sit in an armchair and think up of the correct answer without actually trying out various combinations on a free market of goods and on a free market of ideas. The same dynamic that makes possible a vibrant economy that fulfills consumer demand is also the dynamic that's necessary to arrive at the truth. And another corollary of that understanding is no society, culture, or individual can ever be completely right. And about many things, we are all completely wrong. That goes back to the fundamental questions that I raised earlier that no human being has answered yet. How do we prevent our own bodies from decaying? And how do we prevent our own societies and governments from degenerating? Clearly, we have a long way to go to discover the truth in these realms. So, since all human beings are fallible, and all human beings have demonstrated the capacity to make mistakes from their earliest years, it follows that if we're genuine about pursuing the truth, we all need to improve not just in terms of who we are and our habits, but also in terms of our understanding of the world. We need to improve in such a way as to go beyond where any other thinker in the past has gone. We need to discover more of the truth than anyone else has discovered if we want to live better. And to fix the ways of any culture or society permanently as mandatory norms is to abandon that continual open-ended self-improvement that's required as a part of pursuing truth. It is a sacrifice of truth to conformity. Now let's look at justice. Justice is, of course, a subset of truth, but it is the treatment of each person according to the merits of his or her own actions and in a manner that is conducive to human flourishing. So clearly that fails in an environment of enforced cultural homogeneity because the principles of justice, too, are not automatically revealed to anyone. They need to be discovered. And if you subvert that discovery process, what you stall is what Adam Smith getting back to that great economic thinker, called the circles of sympathy. The broadening of the circles of sympathy, according to Adam Smith in his theory of moral sentiments, is what results in the advancement of human civilization. Adam Smith used some striking comparisons to illustrate his point. So human beings are naturally driven to identify more with their own positions and the positions of the people around them than with the positions of complete strangers. And that's very understandable, and that's completely normal. That is, you live your own life directly. You do not live the life of a complete stranger halfway around the world directly. So what Adam Smith wrote is, most of us in the Western world, if we learn of an earthquake or other massive calamity that kills hundreds of thousands of people in China, we may lament it, we may say how cruel and unjust the world is and how terrible it is that these people have suffered, but we will still eat our supper contentedly. But if any of us loses a finger, it's pretty much guaranteed that we will individually suffer much more than we would suffer upon learning about the deaths of 400,000 strangers. And that's something that's pretty much impossible to escape. However, what is possible is to increasingly be able to place oneself in the position of a stranger, to appreciate what that person is going through, to empathize with that person. And that Adam Smith referred to as encompassing that person within one's own circle of sympathy. It's easier to have tighter knit, closer circles of sympathy. For instance, we all sympathize with our family and our close friends. More people sympathize with people in their own town or in their own state or in their own country. But the mark of a truly civilized and sophisticated and cosmopolitan mindset is to be able to extend some of that sympathy to every human being in the entire world because that is the only way that we can get people to genuinely appreciate and adhere to the universal and inalienable principles of individual rights. 
the idea that every human being, by virtue of who he is, by virtue of what human beings are, can only flourish and is entitled to have the opportunity to flourish if certain prerogatives to action within that human being are recognized. The prerogatives to essentially freely choose how he will live his own life as long as he does not impose coercive harm upon other people. When we continually interact with people who are different, when we act on the traitor principle, when we exchange physical and emotional values and intellectual values as well with others, our circles of sympathy get extended, and we become better able at appreciating the positions of individuals who are different from us, who speak different languages, who live in different parts of the world, who may strongly disagree with us on certain issues. But the more we come into contact with them, the more their humanity becomes apparent to us. And it becomes very difficult then to dismiss these people as just abstractions. Within a culturally homogeneous society, what the elites often try to do is to demonize the other by precluding a lot of contact with other individuals. And when most people, who are not evil people by any stretch of the imagination, think of those individuals, they just think of them as specters in the background, abstractions to be fought, rather than as human beings whose virtues and suffering are clearly apparent before them. So I've articulated some general ideas about the dangers of cultural homogeneity, and I think these are timeless dangers. They've existed historically. They've existed from such societies as ancient Sparta to such contemporary societies as North Korea today. But I'd like to, in concluding my remarks, today, give a few examples that might hit closer to home. So I'm going to briefly read to you a document issued in July 2010 called The Guidelines Regarding the Mission and Moral Commitments of Hillsdale College. And I'll read the entirety of it to be fair. So here goes. This is not me talking, just in case you <laughs> might get any mistaken impressions. Don't attribute this to me. As occasioned by questions from students concerning the moral requisites of sexual activity, the administration and board of trustees of Hillsdale College have established in recent years guidelines to direct campus policies. These guidelines derive from the essential commitments of the college as given in the Articles of Association and Mission Statement. In particular, they bear upon student conduct, organizations, college events, and activities, but they bespeak as well the essential moral understanding of human nature to which the college is dedicated. It is understood that individuals attached to the college may differ with these guidelines or with the moral principles that give rise to them, yet it is also understood that the guidelines are institutionally binding. One, as a place of liberal learning, Hillsdale College has always welcomed thoughtful inquiry and civil debate. Two, since the founding of the college, natural law principles, which support rational inquiry and civil and religious liberty, have been central to its work. From the college's start, the moral tenets of Christianity, as commonly understood in the Christian tradition, have been essential to the mission of the college. Three, thus, here it gets interesting, the college has always understood always understood since when morally responsible sexual acts to be those occurring in marriage and between the sexes. This understanding has been unwavering, undergirds its policies regarding student conduct, and informs its institutional practices. Four, the college cannot therefore lend itself or its approbation to organizations or activities that contravene this commitment. Five, the college welcomes all regardless of their personal beliefs who understand its good faith commitments and are willing to work in that collegial context. Ideological pressures or actions that press the college to abandon its commitments or disrupt its good order, however, are inconsistent with both its independence and its purpose. Seems like a statement that has genteel and somewhat mild-mannered phrasing, but to me, very troubling implications. What it essentially says is, okay, you may disagree to a certain extent, you may have a sphere of expressing your own opinions, but don't you dare live a different way. Don't you dare pursue your own choices, your own views of what is right in this particular realm of activity, or else you will be undermining this collegial context. You will be undermining this mission of the college, this common institutional understanding that is being defined from the top down. And it's very interesting how there's in this statement this appeal to values shared by all or principles that have always been espoused when in fact this statement was issued in July of 2010, after my time at Hillsdale, by the way, and I can tell you that prior to the issuance of that statement, there has been no policy at Hillsdale College directly restricting consensual sexual activity among students. 
there were certainly policies that discouraged certain kinds of associations, say visiting hours, but nothing so explicit, nothing that goes so far as to intrude in the most intimate decisions that people can make. And it's very troubling because I see this as a major shift, one way in which there has been a clear attempt to homogenize the environment here at Hillsdale. And I do think vigorous arguments need to be mounted against this policy. The other example that I wanted to bring forth to you today is that effective, whenever they can get around to it, for some subsequent incoming class of Hillsdale freshmen, it will be mandatory to take a course in theology as part of the core curriculum. And this course, I believe, is called the Western Theological Tradition. But in my view, unfortunately, I think one of the purposes of this course will be to inculcate what certain elements on this campus consider to be the desirable values to be shared by all. And it's not even only in the content of that course that these values will be inculcated, though certainly students who do not agree with the main tenets of Christianity, as for instance, I do not since I'm an atheist, would have a lot to fear for in that course with regard to their own grades. Because how would an essay, a term paper critical of Christianity, be received? But also, the homogenizing effects of that particular requirement will be that it will discourage applications to Hillsdale by individuals who are not themselves Christian and who want to devote their focus to studying other matters, other disciplines or other professions, which I believe a college should definitely facilitate. But there are so many bright, intelligent, industrious, and upstanding moral people who are atheists, Muslims, Jews, Buddhists, and who come from backgrounds that might not even have emphasized Christianity very much or come into very much contact with Christianity. So if they see as one of the requirements for a Hillsdale College student the study of Christian theology, because it will be primarily Christian theology, make no mistake about it, they simply won't apply. And that will, in a subtle, pretty seamless way, but in the long term, very devastating way, undermine the cultural diversity that the Hillsdale campus currently exhibits. It will sap the vigor from the discussions that exist on this campus, and it will prevent people of all persuasions from benefiting from the presence of those who are different from them. And that's not to say that Hillsdale shouldn't offer courses in Christian theology or that the study of Christian theology is undesirable. I could even conceive of side benefits to me from studying that were it not for the rather substantial opportunity cost that I had during my time at Hillsdale and that I have even to a greater extent right now. However, this should always be a choice that is left to the individual. If people believe that that's the way to discover the truth, then certainly they should be free to pursue it. But if some third party, even one calling itself the administration, imposes that pursuit upon them, then that once again is a sacrifice of the objective truth to conformity to the established mold, to the, quote, shared values that somebody tries to impose on us all. So with that provocative ending, I will conclude the formal part of my talk, and I'll leave it open to any questions from you. I'm willing to stay here for as long as you are, because it is three hours earlier for me. So any questions you want to ask about what I presented today or about related subjects, I would welcome, and I would welcome any disagreements from you as well, since we could benefit in that way too. So you entitle your lecture, The Perils of Cultural... Um, homogeny, but in the end, you ended up talking about the perils of intellectual homogeny a lot. Um, can you kind of contrast the differences between the two as you perceive them? Well, certainly the intellectual realm is part of a culture. One could say that it's the animating element of that culture because ultimately anything that you see manifest, a work of art, a work of music, a pattern of social interaction, ultimately arises in the mind of some human being. So the intellect is a very critical part of that. But I think the point I made goes beyond that because, for instance, in my criticism of lifestyle homogeneity of the imposition from the top down of certain norms of sexual conduct. 
I think that is a way in which ideas have consequences. And it's possible for a genteel homogenizing elite to say, okay, we'll give the people a little bit of freedom, or we'll give them freedom in some particular sphere, but not in another. For instance, we'll give them the freedom to talk about certain ideas, unless they're too inflammatory or controversial, but we won't give them the freedom to act on those ideas in a peaceful way. And of course, ultimately, that kind of compartmentalization of some peaceful activities being open and others being restricted will break down at some point. Because there is no neat, tidy line between, say, the intellectual realm and the lifestyle realm. Just like there's no neat, tidy line sometimes between fiction and nonfiction. Because often in very oppressive regimes, you had some very intricately disguised political commentaries that were styled as works of fiction. So I think when we look at concepts like cultural or intellectual or artistic homogeneity, we have to be very careful to recognize that these are just very vague, broad, approximate kinds of classifications, that they overlap and they bleed into one another. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I don't know if this is really a question so much as just a comment, but at first I was very intrigued. I thought this was a very good presentation, very, very good points. Um, the, uh, just thinking about this a little bit, it, it strikes me that this cultural homo homogeneity threat is something that is, has grown uh, quite a bit in recent times. It seems to characterize what we have for political debates today, mm -hmm. uh, a kind of intolerance where we're not arguing about ideas, but rather demonizing each other. This comes from pretty much across the political spectrum, including the way that libertarians argue. Uh, uh, these days, demonization of, of opponents rather than uh, uh, any sort of uh, discussion of ideas. Um, one thing that struck me from this, where you're talking about about how this perverts the dominant culture, I think that it also does a great deal of damage to individuals. Frederick Douglass, in his uh, uh, on, on my slave, my bondage, and my freedom, in his book on his experience as a slave observes that slavery does more harm to the character and personality of the slaveholder than it does to the slave. He makes quite an extensive argument for this and observes what it sees it do to people who suddenly become slaveholders and weren't, were not previously slaveholders. And I think the idea of trying to stamp out or trying to, trying to regiment or control ideas and not tolerate the ideas does great harm to them. And it doesn't matter whether their ideas are right or wrong. I think that's an excellent point, and I certainly agree with everything you've said. I think you phrased it very eloquently. And on the subject of sometimes libertarians being prey to that kind of mentality and to the mentality of demonizing their opponents, it's interesting that when I first became involved in intellectual discourse in my mid-teens, the first place where I found this kind of demonization was among the ranks of self-styled objectivists. So it's something to think about. It's definitely a tendency to which no person or no group of people is immune. And I think one has to very frequently reflect on whether one's actions and one's conduct really represent the spirit of the ideas that one claims to promote. Because human beings are fallible. And some people, even when they think that they're just advocating for liberty and individualism, may nonetheless lapse into these kinds of tribalistic mindsets. So it is very important to be circumspect and to look at ways in which one's own position could be wrong, to look at what are in truth the strongest arguments against what one is trying to say, not just what are some arguments that you can put forward that would be easy to demolish or would be impressive if you demolish them in front of other people, but also is there a way to improve what you're talking about? Is there a way to make it approximate the truth a bit better? So, um, Donati, specifically um, talking about Hillsdale College, mm -hmm. how is it, do you think, that the administration can specifically walk the fine line between transmitting really uh, valuable um, 
uh, ideas about objective truth and traditional values while not discouraging um, or not encouraging cultural homogeneity? Well, I think that's definitely a valid question in the sense that there are legitimate purposes to Hillsdale College as an institution. It's to impart knowledge onto students, to expand their opportunities, because hopefully by getting a liberal arts education at Hillsdale College, the students hope to benefit from that education for the rest of their lives. If they didn't have that hope, if they didn't have that intention, then going to Hillsdale would be completely futile. So there are values that Hillsdale College can confer upon its students. But I think the way to confer those values is for Hillsdale College to subject itself more to what Milton Friedman called the only true sovereignty, which is consumer sovereignty. Because it's very interesting. If I go into the Walmart and there's something that I want. Say I want to buy a picture frame and a Sansa Clip MP3 player. The clerks, or I suppose a better analogy would be the management of Walmart, doesn't come up to me and stop me in front of the store shelves and say, no, 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 we believe that what is best for you is to have an iPod and a woven tapestry. And if you want to embody the shared values of all of us in the Walmart community, then this is what you have to buy. And it's not cheap. <laughs> Hillsdale education is not cheap either. But I think it would be a worthwhile investment if the people doing the investing, which are primarily the students, even if their parents pay for it, primarily the students are the direct consumers of that education. They should be the ones who decide what they get out of it and in what direction they pursue it. Now, like any store, for instance, Hillsdale College has more of some offerings and fewer of others. The Walmart isn't going to carry every commodity. And for some commodities that aren't there, you might want to go elsewhere. The analogy would be if there's something you want to study that's not offered at Hillsdale, study it on your own time or enroll in a different school or take a course, a professional examination somewhere else. However, it should be left to the choice of the consumer. What Hillsdale should position itself as is the provider of a very high quality selection of goods where you have these professors who are experts in their chosen disciplines. And if you affirmatively choose to take their classes as part of a major program, then you get to benefit from what they offer you. There's another way in which the Hillsdale administration can legitimately enforce certain norms, and these are norms of working order, the kinds of norms that are required for this offering of services to be effective in the first place. For instance, it would be very legitimate to have a rule saying, don't behave yourself in a disruptive fashion in the classroom. Or if Hillsdale is offering dormitory housing, there should be a rule that says, don't behave yourself in a disruptive fashion in the dorms. The rules could be a bit more specific and define what that is. Because all of the students, all of the consumers come to Hillsdale College to benefit in certain ways. And again, the liberties of each consumer should be respected such that no consumer should be allowed to infringe on the liberties of another. It's like a rule, a very elementary rule that's implicit in the Walmart. Don't go in and hassle other customers. Don't steal money from the cash register. So those kinds of rules and those kinds of values are definitely very appropriate. It's at the point at which you can conceive of a peaceful, non-invasive, non-intrusive alternative that doesn't hurt other people, but the powers that be foreclose on that alternative. That is where I think the line gets crossed. And being forced to take a theology course is very much crossing that line. With regard to a core curriculum in general, I think some people might raise the question of, well, do you oppose core curricula altogether because students are in that way required to take certain particular courses? I would say I would prefer to have a voluntary core where if the Hillsdale administration believes that a certain set of knowledge is very useful for the good life or a good human being, however they might envision it, they could create an optional core or an honorary core where if you take the core courses, 
you get special honors. It's a carrot approach rather than a stick approach. Maybe you get a special cord at graduation. Maybe you get little perks like attendance to certain seminars that are only for the people who take the core. There are literally thousands of ways that it can be structured. But even within a mandatory core, there are some mandates that are less grievous than others. If it's a mandatory core that teaches general skills and knowledge, for instance, an English course that concentrates on literature, literature from various perspectives, literature that is universally known and well-recognized to be high-quality literature. Well, that's a non-ideological course. And you can even look at Christianity having some role in that non-ideological course because it's undeniable that Christianity has had an influence on Western history and on Western culture. I may think that influence has been deleterious in many cases, but it's very important to understand it for what it is and to study it. And of course, in other ways, there have been Christians who have influenced the Western world very positively. So that kind of focus, a generalized focus, be it on skills or on a particular universally acknowledged body of work, is less objectionable. I would still wouldn't make it mandatory, but the mandatory core of that sort, the former core, the core that I went to Hillsdale College with, is something I could live with in practice. Can I say something about that also? Just like draw an analogy with something that Frederick Bastiat said. And Bastiat is talking about legal plunder. Uh, he says there are two ways that people can respond to plunder. One is to say, let's, let's put a stop to it. And the other is to say, let's get our share as well. It's extended to it extend plunder to ourselves as well, uh, or the ability to plunder. And in some ways, what we've seen in, others, in, in many other universities is that there's a, uh, a core that ends up getting a lot of politically correctness, political correctness into it, a lot of uh, nonsensical stuff. And one way to respond to that is say, we're, we're going to try to avoid that. And another way to respond is, we're going to have our own political correctness. It'll be different. Mm -hmm. I think that is what many of the faculty members, and certainly what I think is behind part of what happened with this, uh, this new court of mm -hmm. So just, just trying to set up different values. Mm -hmm. um, and so the question is, how might they respond to it? Uh, what might be a good way to respond to it? Well, for one thing, we don't have crazy classes that are sometimes used in, in some of the uh, 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 diversity political correctness courses. So that's part of it. Part, of, part is just having good solid course, courses to choose from. Because um, that's my, my quick response. <laughs> Absolutely. I think you make very valid points that in the face of what could be perceived as indoctrination on the part of the other side, there is a strong temptation to say, well, we'll just counterbalance that with a bit of our own. And I think if I spoke to maybe some of the members of the administration or the faculty who advocate this kind of approach, and I had a nice polite discussion with them, they could tell me, well, look, indoctrination and the other direction is happening all throughout the country and there are tens of universities where you could go to get the other perspective so we'll just offer our perspective but I don't think it works ultimately in the way that they think I think what really happens is the attempt to homogenize a given institution sets up a kind of bubble around that institution hence the colloquial expression of the Hillsdale bubble and that I think does a great disservice to people who are here because it shields them from genuinely engaging the other side and genuinely offering a way out of this cycle of mutual indoctrination. I mean, this also reminds me of uh, the whole discussion reminds me so much of the history of economic thought force. Mm -hmm. uh, because when I teach it, one of the things that does bother me is that we do, we, we're pretty homogeneous in a way in the economics that we teach here. Mm -hmm. And so I'm teaching, of course, which so you may remember, but I, when I teach, when I teach the, uh, for example, the section on Marxism, mm -hmm. I try to convert the course to, stories, try to convert the students to Marxism. Uh, I view very successful, um, but I, I think it's important to try to get this idea of having a number of different perspectives. Uh, the more that I study other people's ways of thinking, the more that I look at my own trying to challenge it, I, I think the more I learn, the stronger my own thinking becomes. Mm -hmm. And so it really isn't to worry about our, our 
worry about that I think is quite important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And this is an excellent approach to pursue, essentially. Give perspectives, even perspectives one doesn't hold a fair hearing, not just to understand them for what they are and be able to competently respond to them, but also there may be some beneficial elements to them as well. I know that given my family background, many of the older generations of my family are well versed in Marxism, but it's interesting because my father sometimes brings up a decent point about one of the things that Marx and Engels wrote, and that is that ultimately the purpose of a human economy is not work, it's obtaining greater leisure. It's essentially obtaining greater opportunities for free time where individuals can direct themselves and improve themselves. And while that may sound like a bit of a utopian aspiration given the larger context of what Marx and Engels were writing, I think it can actually cohere pretty well with a lot of free market economic ideas. For instance, there's a lot of political talk right now about more jobs being the aim of economic policy. Well, the aim shouldn't directly be more jobs. It should be more prosperity. And in a more prosperous society, we don't have to work from sunrise to sunset. We have a bit more leisure because we have more resources available to us and easier ways of obtaining resources through the division of labor and the capital that has been accumulated. So it's interesting to me how if you give a fair hearing to opposing ideas, you'll find some nuggets of good thought in them that you can then and say, yes, they're valid, and they can apply to your own framework. Mm -hmm. Looks like we're uh, about all set on questions here, Johnny. All right. Well, Thank you very much. We appreciate it. Certainly. Certainly. Thank you for coming, and I appreciate the very interesting discussion that we've had. And uh, have a good night. Yes, you too. Thank you.